all Mint's courses are going to look like what you've got in your hands right now, right? So this is, this is a standard format for a Mint's course. At bachelor's level, they run to about 100 pages in length. At master's level, they run up to about 130 pages in length, all right? And we can straddle both worlds um, as you go into it, and as you get into it, we can actually straddle both worlds, and we can lecture on one, and then the master's students then ex end up doing extra reading from the bachelor's students, extra reading and a longer essay, all right? We're using standard examination type protocols, as I said, from Florida. So here we go. So we've got this introduction. I'm going to work our way through what that is in a little while. Course content. Uh, all Mint's courses are divided into eight lessons, all right? This is the law of the Medes and the Persians. We have to have some sort of symmetry to our, our thing. So whether it's, whether it's a book of, you know, Jude, which runs to, what, 20-something verses, or whether it's the book of Romans, it's going to be eight courses. How we divide that up is just the, the realities. Um, what you have in front of you is a full exposition of the notes, and it is from the notes that you will be examined. So I, I get the luxury of standing here and making sure that you understand everything. And that's why I said, give me feedback and stop me if there's something that you don't understand or you want clarification or expansion. But the notes are a full exposition. The one thing I'm not going to do is sit here and read the notes to you. All right? So, but everything that you need is in these notes. Um, and there is, so the, the notes are your first part. The, the second thing is there's extra reading. And in fact, for this one, I'm going to give you an option um, of, of two things, and we can discuss this some more later. Um, but you can either get one of the books, which you can download or get, or get sent to you. Um, I had meant to bring some coffees out with me, and somewhere between jet lag and various other things that happened, I realized too late that I hadn't got on Amazon and got some books ordered. Um, but the other thing that we do have is a series, and um, there's a series of lectures online which are very, very good, and I'm going to be referring you to them. So instead, in this particular course, instead of just reading the book, you, you can listen to 20, I think it's 23 or 24 hours worth of lectures. Um, but they're up on, on, on iTunes, and that would be in lieu of reading the book. All right. So that's, I'm just trying to sort of fill out, fill out and answer your question. So if you were, if you were doing it for credit, uh, we give you a certain amount of credit for being here, being alive, breathing. Um, then in addition to which, uh, you get the notes. You are required, and I'll show you this in a minute, but you are required to answer 10 questions at, e at the end of each lecture. So at the end of each lecture, if you turn through your notes here, you will see, um, let me see, page 18, should be around page 18 on your notes, you will see lesson one questions, right? And those questions come directly from the material that is in the notes, so there's no surprises there, right? And the objective is for you just to make sure that you understand the key areas and the pivotal areas that we're dealing with. So, you be here for the lectures, you go through the notes, which I'm going to go through with you, highlighting the most important things, you do the lesson questions at the end, you do the reading or the listening, and I actually would recommend the listening for this one, um, and, and do a short report, we'll, we'll give you a report, and I'll explain some more of that later on. Uh, you'll do a reading report, or a listening report in this case, um, there will be an essay. If you're doing it at a bachelor's level, it would be um, five to eight pages long. And if you're doing it at master's level, it's somewhere around 10 to 15 pages long. And there's a final exam. Okay? No, I am going to be lecturing to you for the week. Um, and then uh, the, the, the homework and things like that will be, will be covered when I'm gone. Um, it depends how fast we go, and it depends how, I'm, you know, how we see it. Quite often in some centers, when I have a solid four hours in the morning, I might go and I'll be lecturing from eight to one. Then we go and have lunch, and then everybody does homework in the afternoon for a while, whatever reading they can. We come back the next day, and we go over the reading. 
and the homework and the answers to make sure that everybody's got it, because the homework is homework to help you to grow and understand. Um, in this context, it's not going to work like that, I don't think, because of the, con the time constraints that you've got. And so I'm quite happy to punt and just go through the lectures now, and then you'll have a little bit longer. Seth and I will talk about how much longer he's going to give you to work through the uh, thing. So basically, if you can be here during the week, that's great. That gets the lectures done, and then you're going to have to go back. You're going to have to do the homework, and then there's a listening report instead of a reading report, and an essay. We, we, you know, we're demanding all of these things, obviously, because ultimately that's what the state of Florida demands of us. And that's, that's our parameters. Okay? Any other questions? Now, all of that is actually in these notes. If you look, all our notes always start with an introduction. So it'll talk about the course materials. It'll talk about how the course is organized, which is always into eight. It'll show you a course evaluation, for example. How will this course be evaluated? And so if you look at that, it says student participation, 15%. Student homework, 15%. Student reading or listening, in this case, 20%. The essay, 25%. And the final exam, 25%. And it's all run on American grading. So if you're not familiar with American grading, um, it, it's very different. I mean, I, I know there's some English people here. And it's, it's, it's very, very different from the English system, but you'll get there. All right? It's more of a negative way. You, get, you lose points rather than accumulating points. Okay. But now, you know, don't worry about the grading at this stage. I, I wouldn't let it concern you. Any other questions? All right. Let's pray then and we can start and start the course. Father, we do, um, we do thank you for this opportunity to study your word, um, to grow in it, to humble ourselves before you. Teach us, uh, show us the things of Christ. Uh, may the Holy Spirit help us and sustain us and support us. Uh, may he indeed lead us into all truth, even as you promised that he would. Um, and give us concentration and uh, the ability to work tonight uh, after a long day. Uh, do help us, for we look to you. We know that you are able and you are most willing. And so to you we come in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Um, the, the, the topic, as you can see here... Um, is, is really the God's promises as they come through in the covenant. The covenant. And you may think, well, I, I haven't really given any thought to this whole idea of covenant and what is a covenant. But just look at the verse that I've got on your opening page, right? Right on the very first page. What does the Lord Jesus Christ say if you're going to a, a, a Lord's Supper or something of that nature, a Eucharist or a Lord's Supper, uh, what are, what are the words that are often used if, in the reading? This cup is poured out for you is the, the new covenant in my blood. And so right from the get-go, right at the heart of pretty much everything that is in Scripture is this concept of a new covenant. A new covenant in my blood. And so what I want to do is I just want to start by talking about why do we look at these covenantal promises? Why are they important as a theme? And I hope by the time we're finished, you're going to see how they really encompass everything. They, they run through everything. Um, if you're into statistics, um, the word covenant is used 313 times in Scripture. So that should make your ears pick up if it's used that many times in Scripture. Maybe it's an important concept that runs through the scripture. Um, uh, the other thing uh, that we're going to see as we go through is that, that those, these covenantal promises, as they manifest themselves, run and structure the Bible. They structure it right from the book of Genesis all the way to the end. And so if you want to understand how the Bible fits together, which was one of the first reasons why uh, I started studying the whole topic, was asking the question, all right, I've got a Bible, and here it is in front of me. Uh, how do I read it? How does it all fit together? What's the relationship of the Old Testament, if you open it, to, to the New Testament? How do all the parts link together? And this course will seek to answer just that. How does everything fit together? together. 
So, I mean, that's a fairly big topic, right? I mean, how does the whole of the Word of God actually run together? Another reason for looking at covenant theology is one I've already mentioned to you. The Lord Jesus describes his death as the new covenant. And, and amongst Christians, of course, what is, what is more important than understanding what Jesus was doing in giving his life for sinners? And without understanding this whole idea of a covenant, uh, you won't get the depth of what Christ giving himself for sinners actually means. And if the Lord Jesus had any number of ways of describing his death, didn't he? I mean, he could have chosen any number of ways. And significantly, he picks up on the covenantal promises and says, this is the new covenant in my blood. All right? Um, uh, the other thing is, maybe a lot of you have asked questions about, um, you know, what are you doing in the Lord's Supper? What about baptism? Questions of why do we baptize? Who do we baptize? All of those questions flow directly out of the issue of covenantal theology. Um, they are subsidiary to the main issue. So once we've dealt with, and as we go through this course, the first thing is to establish and understand what the covenants are, and then we'll go and look at, okay, how does that apply to the Lord's Supper? What does it mean when we come to the table? Are there things that we should know? And likewise, with baptism, why do we do what we do with baptism? It flows directly out of these covenantal promises that work their way through Scripture. And uh, a final point, just to sort of establish, if you like, why we study covenantal theology, and particularly why these covenantal promises are important, is it's only through the covenant that God relates to you. You, you can have a relationship with God without understanding what I've just said. You can come to God directly. But to really understand the nature of the relationship that God has with you and you have with God, you need to understand these words. You know, what Jesus says, you know, that it is through the covenant that we come to him. It is through his promises that we come to him. And it is these promises then that regulate our relationship with our Lord. It's, it's, a, it's an emotional thing, certainly. It's a commitment that we make by faith, but it has a structure. And these promises are what govern this particular structure. All right? So, um, let me just give you a quote. This is from J.I. Packer. And he says, The gospel promises offering Christ and his benefits to sinners are invitation to enter and enjoy a covenant relationship with God. Faith in Jesus Christ is accordingly the embrace of the covenant and Christian life glorifying God by one's word and one's works for the greatness of his goodness and grace as at its heart covenantal communion between the Savior and the sinner. All right? Um, so this is J.I. Packer. He's a, he's a really renowned theologian. Uh, and he's putting these things right in the heart, the things that we're going to study tonight, right in the heart of Christianity. Um, any questions so far? Comments, observations? We've just, just sort of done point one, so now we can move on to point two. All right. Well, I hope I've sold to you at least that, that this is absolutely foundational, right? And whenever we do a course or we do courses, we try to do a course are dealing with this topic fairly early on because it creates the, the structure, the, the foundational structure of which everything else, frankly, gets built um, as we go forward. All right, I've been using this word covenant. Um, what does the word covenant or covenantal promises, what does the word mean? Does anybody have an idea? I've been mean, throwing around this word covenant. Any suggestions? Promise, yeah. Uh, that'll, that'll go somewhat to answering it, yeah. Okay. Um, now that, now that's, that. right. So if you were to open your Bible, what do you find in the back? The Old? The Old Testament, right? And what happens if you go into the middle, you know? You get the 
the New Testament, right? Um, so there's a clear correspondence, and we're going to look at that in detail, right, um, between a testament and a covenant. We're going to be studying some of that in some detail as we go through, right? Um, in its root, and it's, it's, it's quite important that we understand this, in its root, the word covenant means to cut or to bind. To cut or to bind in the Hebrew. And you've got the word there, bereth, in your notes. I'm on page 6, um, under here, section 2. All right, And the idea is you cut a covenant. You bind two purses together. Can you think of some issues or some points in Abraham's life where there was a lot of blood and a lot of sacrifices and things like that were going on? They were covenantal passages. Can you think of any? Anybody suggestions? Well, can anybody remember what happens to Abraham when he falls asleep? Right, right. So we go back, and we're going to look at that passage later in more detail. But Abraham, remember, he wants a son. He doesn't have a son. And his faith is weak, but he's holding on to God's promises. And then he falls asleep. And what happens next? Something strange happens. By, by Certainly by Western standards, something extremely strange happens. He falls asleep. He's terrified. And what happens is an animals are put in front of him. He sees animals, and they're cut in half, and this torch, this living flame, goes between the, the animals. Well, what is that? Well, that's a covenantal seminary. They have, the animals have been cut. God passes through. He makes promises. And he says to them, basically, the essence of the promise is, if I break the promise, I will be like this animal, torn in two. All right? That's what's going on in Genesis chapter, um, Genesis chapter 15. We get something similar with the covenant of circumcision in chapter 17. All right? And you get the same thing. You get the cutting off of the foreskin, which is a cut to bind. That's the sign of the covenant. And it's the same thing. It binds one with another. So that Abraham and his children are bound to God in this solemn covenant. Um, there are places in the world, for example, where you get the same sort of thing. You, if, you were, if you were in parts of, of West Africa and you went into an agreement with somebody and you said, well, we want to make a binding covenant, you'd get a chicken and you'd wring its neck and you'd spill the blood on the ground. What are you doing? You're saying, this is a binding promise between us and if I fail to do my part of the bargain, let me be Literally, the blood wrung out, let, it, let me be like this animal, dead. So you said promise. Yes, it's a promise, but there are huge consequences with the promise, right? So it's a binding promise, which has huge, huge implications. Um, you know, we do it. I used to be a, a lawyer, you know, in my previous life. Um, and um, every time you make a contract, you're doing something similar. Right? You go and spend some money down at the supermarket, you exchange certain things, or there's a promise that you will do certain things, and they get certain things in return. And in your case, it's, it's finances, you will supply them with a certain amount of money, and they will supply you with some goods. Now what happens if you pay, and then they'll supply them next week, and they don't pay? Right, okay, now we've got a, now we've got a legal situation arising, and you can enforce that promise, can't you? All right? They've got to give you something in return. But in our world, it's limited to financial damages. I mean, there, are, there are some exceptions, but it's mostly limited. If they don't pay you, they've either got to give you your money back, give you damages, or something in that line. In this covenant, where you are cutting and you are binding, it is a covenant is a bound unto death. Let me be like this animal rent apart. Those are the only types, not the only, but those are the, that's pretty much the main type of covenant God does. Let me, it's a life and death thing, and it's an enforceable life and death thing between God and his people. All right, um, let's just deal with some, some other things. So we've got the basic idea, and we're going to look at that in more detail in a second. Uh, in the Old Testament, in the Septuagint, if I say the Old Testament Septuagint, the LXX version, what am I talking about? Does anybody know? You know the history of translation? Yeah, you're getting a nod. You're going to have to. You're going to have to. You're going to have to speak up now. No, I 
Now, the Old Testament was, was translated in about 230 or so BC from Hebrew into Greek. And that was done according to legend, and it is according to legend, by 70 scholars in 70 days. And it got the, it got the name from that, the, L, the shortened name, the LXX, or the Saturatin version, all right? LXX being 50 plus 10 plus 10, right, in Latin. So it's the 70. So that's what you've got. The Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, they needed to find an appropriate word to take this word of cutting or binding. They needed to find an appropriate word that they could then move it into the Greek. And you know how difficult it is when you're talking one language and you try to find a suitable word to move it into another language. Sometimes it fits really easily and sometimes it can be very, very difficult to do. And in this case, it proved very, very difficult to do as they moved from the Hebrew to the Greek. And I just, I mentioned the Septuagint because the apostles often used the Septuagint. When they quoted the New Testament, they were quite often quoting the Septuagint version. So they had two choices. So you're moving a word from one culture and one linguistic group to another, and you're ending up with two choices. And the one is diathike, all right? Diathike. The other was a word called synthike. Now, diathike is a useful word. It's about death, and it's about sort of the end and promises, but it brings with it this idea of last will and testament that you mentioned earlier, right? So it, it's more like a last will and testament idea. And then you had the word synthike, which is an agreement between two parties. And they, they didn't choose, they could have chosen either. And they chose to use the word diathike, not santhike. And the reason was they didn't like the idea that when we have two people sitting negotiating a contract, they didn't like the idea that man was seen to be negotiating with God. So they, were, wanted, a, they wanted a word that said, well, God is just telling man not to do. Adam and Eve, when they were in the garden, didn't say, well, let's, let's sit down and work out the, the, the contract of my existence, right? And I like that term, and I don't like that term, and let's renegotiate this bit of my life. And No, God comes to them and says, and speaks to them and says, do this, don't do this, I will bless you if you do this, and I will curse you if you do that. So they didn't like the word synthike because it stressed equality, two people bargaining. And so they chose the word diathike, all right? But that was a compromise, it wasn't necessarily the best word. But that answers the question of why we have the Bible divided up into two different books. The Old Testament and the New Testament. They're taking that word diathike and putting it there instead. They could equally, and a lot of scholars would say they probably should have, called it the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. All right? They had to make a choice and they made the choice, and those were the two that they had. All right. So in the Greek New Testament, I'm under number 2-2, the word diathike was retained um, because the definition of the word, though, should come from the Old Testament, and the word in Greek should be interpreted rather as covenant, a bond in blood between God and man, not so much a last will and testament. Well, what's the difference here? Well, let me explain to you the difference. Um, when does a will come into force? My father was talking about redoing his will recently. When would it, when would it come into force? When Only when he dies, right? He can change it any time he likes up to the moment that he dies. I mean, it's enforced at one level, but it's always changeable. Whereas the idea of a contract, when does that come into existence? right when you make it. You see the difference, right? And so, um, well, think about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Was that a last will and testament when God says, here are the rules of living in the garden, or was it more like a contract? It was a lot more like a contract, right? And so for that reason, um, the word diathike was made, used, um, but actually the better idea that should be running through that idea is closer to the contract, except for, as I said, in contracts, you and I negotiate, you know, you pay me $10, I'll do your lawn. But in this context, it's not really, it's one-sided, isn't it? God speaks, he speaks and says, this is what you are to do, and man doesn't have a choice in it, all right? 
So that, I think, helps, helps you understand. Over time, the scriptures then, so you've moved from Hebrew word, then you have two Greek words. What comes next in, in Latin Christianity or Western Christianity? I've just given you the answer now, haven't I? Latin, right? Okay. So what comes next? In Latin, all right, the, the Bible gets translated into Latin, and for a long, long time, that word testamentum was used. So for a long, long time, that whole idea of a testament is just being sort of really thrown down in front of everybody, all right? And it's only right towards the last few hundred years that we've suddenly switched back to this idea of a covenant because people are accessing the original Greek and then they're going back and accessing the Hebrew and saying, well, wait a minute, you know, the, the better understanding of this is uh, a binding berith or a covenant, all right? If you read through... Um, some of the older literature, you might see the following words, just um, again, I'm under 2.3. You might see uh, the word testamentum, meaning a testament. You might see the word uh, fetus, which means federal or a representative, and we're going to explain that in a while. That, that word is quite common, these are Latin words. Um, or you might see the idea of a pactum which you can work out as a pact between two parties. And that would be, if you're reading some of the older works on covenant theology, they use those words. So just be aware of those words and how they're used, but they are often common words for the covenant. So you might be reading something that will talk about the pactum salutis, and you'll go, well, okay, I know what that is now. It's not just a Latin phrase that I don't know. It comes out of this idea of covenant, and it was used from the idea of covenant. Okay? Now, we, we've got to pin it down somewhat and give it a definition. So what is a covenant? I'm going to give you a, a definition by a, a man by the name of Palmer Robertson. And he's the book, or one of the books, if you, you can get it, and we'll talk more about getting the books. But he's one of the guys, and you can get the book. And he calls it, and it's helpful, a bond in blood sovereignly administered. A bond in blood sovereignly administered administered. All right? It's a bond between two people. In our case, it could be in scriptures, sometimes there are man-to-man -man covenants. So if you think back into Genesis, can you remember the story of Genesis and wells and too many people and then they enter into a covenant? Abraham enters into a covenant with his neighbor that he'll move to a different place and they won't steal each other's, each other's wells. All right? And so you can go back and read those stories. And so there are man-to-man -man covenants in the scripture, but obviously the one that we're really focusing on is the God-to-man covenant. That's what we're going to be focusing on. All right? So it's a bond, it's in blood, and it's sovereignly administered. That's a, a definition, a working definition for us. All right? So let's work our way through. Firstly, it's a bond. I think we've covered that. All right? Um, normally... It's a promise accompanied by some sort of sign that comes along with it. A promise accompanied by some sort of sign. Um, what was the promise made to Noah? Can you remember? Excellent. And what was the sign that came along with it? Right. So it's a promise connected often with a sign. The promise to Abraham that he would have a seed. What was the sign that was given to him? Circumcision. All right? So often it's a promise with a sign. Secondly, as we've said, do men negotiate these contracts? No. God gives them to us, right? We live in his world. He's the creator. He says, here it is. These are the terms. So it is sovereignly administered. And then third point, as I said, it is in blood. If you break the contract, you can't buy your way out of it like you can in civil law. Uh, you can't just pay damages or agree to do something else. It's in blood. If this thing is broken, you forfeit your life. And correspondingly, if God were to break the contract, he would forfeit his life. And we're going to look at some of the implications of that as we go on. Because ultimately, how are we saved? through Christ giving himself in our place, all right? And we're going we're gonna to tease out some of those implications, all right? But think back right from the beginning in the book of Genesis. What's, what's the promise related to the tree? If you can have any, you can eat from what? 
Adam and Eve, you can eat from any tree in the garden except the tree of life. You take from the tree of life, what happens? Or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What happens? Right, you die. On the day that you will, you will actually, you know, in your, your English version, it will probably say you surely die. The Hebrew literally leads, it doesn't have the word surely as an adjective. So it's got the day you eat of it, you will die, die. Right, that's the way the Hebrew would say it. You will die, die. Right? That's the intensifier that it runs on the top. Okay? So it's a bond. It's in blood. That is life and death. And it's sovereignly administered. And I hope just by giving you some of these illustrations, you can see how often it comes up. Right? We're beginning to see it come up. Can you think of some other illustrations where there's a bond in blood and promises in blood? What happens when... when, when uh, when, when Moses is at Mount Sinai. What does he do? What, how, does he, how does he confirm everything? They get blood. If I'm Moses, and I've brought down the tablets, and I'm standing here, and you're the children of Israel, I get the sacrifice, the offering, and I sprinkle the blood over you and over the book, or over you and over the stones. What does that signify? We have a bond in Blood. What are the terms? Whatever's written down there. Right? And what is the Lord Jesus Christ? How do we open this? This is the new covenant in my, in my blood. Okay? So all the way through the scriptures, this idea of God binding himself in a covenantal relationship, he's the one who works out the terms. He's the one who specifies what's going on. And at the same time, the consequences of breach of contract are death. It's a bond in blood sovereignly administered. It's an oath unto death. Did all of the covenants? Just about every single one of them has blood involved in them. All of the major covenants that we will study between God and man that we're going to go through are sealed with blood. Right. No, and we're going to talk about that. But what was, what was God's promise to them? Right, and so now you've moved from one covenant to a different covenant, and we'll talk about that, okay. So, so when we first started, there was what we'll call the covenant of works, and we're going to get into that in a second, all right? So when we first started, there was the covenant of works, and Adam was given a covenant, and the day you eat of it, you will surely die, all right? Um, but God graciously intervenes, and as we're going to see next big lesson, God intervenes and puts another covenant on top of that one. And that is the covenant of grace. And you, you know, it was a terminology that you used there, right? And so he puts a second covenant on top of that, which, which then brings life. Okay? Right, and there was, a, there was an element there of typology, and there's an element of forwards looking at that point, isn't there? Um, and so we're looking forwards, and so we do see that, and of course, at another level, Adam does die, but only physically, but he dies, because death in the Bible, as we'll, as we'll study when we get there, is, is separation from God. In, in, in scriptures, death is separation, and, and, and so you can be... You can be, as, as Paul will say, you who were dead in trespasses and sins. Well, I was walking around, yeah, but I was separated from God and his goodness and his blessings and his promises. And the next step for me was physical death, and the next step for me is to be cast into outer darkness. It's all a form of separation. Okay. But great question. Good question. All right. Um, what I want to do right now um, is I want to look at some, just an, an illustration of a covenant, just to give you some idea um, of how the, the thing is often used. Um, and that's the, the clearest biblical illustration of a covenant, and we use this word, till death do us part, which comes from marriage, right? And that's the clearest or biggest illustration which is used in the scripture to illustrate this idea of a covenant. All right? Um, God uses this image of a man and a woman in marriage as a covenantal relationship and then applies it, a human relationship, applies it to himself 
to the children of Israel, and then we see the same image being used in the New Testament. So in both Testaments, God says he is married to his people. All right? Um, It says uh, in Ezekiel, for example, "I, I saw you, you were naked, you were on the ground, you were helpless. I came to you, I clothed you, I looked after you, and then I took you to myself and I married you. And he gives you this idea. So the covenant which God, between God and Israel, is expressed in terms of a marriage covenant. And what does it say in, the, in Ephesians uh, chapter 5? The mystery of marriage is uh, relating to what, or pointing to what? Christ and his? Yeah, Christ and his church, right? And so this image of marriage is a very useful one. And the, the two points I want to just pick out, you know, in, in a marriage, generally speaking, you've got two dynamics going on. You've got an emotional level of and you've got a legal level, right? You have two people who are emotionally committed to one another, but you formalize that with a formal arrangement, a formal witnessed public arrangement. And it's the same way in salvation, using the same analogy, right? God is, if you like, he has his people, he loves them. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, and he he puts his son out there, and then Formally and legally, he binds himself to his people. And and, and at that point, you've gone beyond just a commitment. You've got a a formal, public, legal commitment. So when we come to the Lord and we become his, God binds us to himself using this idea. Um, your, Your relationship to God is such that you have a binding covenant with him. You know, you know, how many times you, you, you um, there are times when we feel good about stuff and we come quickly to the Lord, and there are times when we don't feel so good about stuff, right? And uh, we, we're, we're reminded it's not about our feelings. You are bound to him by a covenantal relationship. And that covenantal relationship controls how he looks at you. You are my people. I am your God. And how we look at him and how he deals with us. And he always deals with us faithfully according to his covenantal promises. So that's just a great illustration. This idea of marriage is a, is a great uh, illustration for us to think about, and this is why it's in Scripture. Um, what's that relationship between me and my God? God is married to his people, and that involves obligations. That involves all sorts of things at a whole lot of levels. Um, now, obviously, all analogies break down, right? Otherwise, they weren't, they're not analogies at that point. They're reality. Um, so all analogies break down. But it's a, it's a very useful idea, particularly when you pick up this idea of it's not just an emotional commitment. It is, in addition to an emotional commitment, it is a legal binding obligation. And Christ says, this is the new covenant of my blood. He's bringing a lot of Old Testament ideas straight off the page that they would have understood sitting in that upper room of God covenanting with his people. Okay? All right, if you can hang on for a few more minutes, then we'll have a break in a few moments. But um, what I want to do is, is look at what we'll call the three leading covenants. Now, we've touched in discussion, we've touched on two of them, but we've got three leading covenants that you'll see. And I'm on uh, page nine, number four. And this is a, a slight oversimplification, but it's, it's helpful to, to get us working as we go through. So the first is what we'll call the covenant of works, and this is terminology that I'll talk to you about in a second, and that is between God and Adam in the garden, right? That's the original covenant in history, working its way down. Secondly is what we'll call the covenant of redemption. Now this is a little bit trickier to describe, because although it's the second covenant, it is also, like all of these things, ordained before the foundation of the world, and we're going to look at that. So before even Adam and Eve were created and made, the father enters into this covenant with his son. So that's why we have Adam, who's called the first man. Who's the second man? Christ. Who's the last man? The last Adam? Christ. All right, there's two words that are used of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the the second man. He's the last Adam. And both of those pull us back to this idea. But the father, just as the father spoke to Adam and said, here's a covenant, So he speaks to the second representative, which is Christ. And all these transactions, and we're we're going to look at some of them, not not in a huge amount of depth, 
but we're going to look at a whole lot of these. Why does the Lord Jesus come? What does he say in John's gospel? Why do I come? I come because the Father has a job for me to do. I am doing your will. When did all that happen? Well, before the foundation of the world. All right, an agreement was entered into between the Father and the Son. And for, for historical reasons, we're going to call this the covenant of redemption. All right, and we're going to expand each one of those. And then thirdly, we're going to look at this idea of a covenant of grace. So the, the idea of, of God dealing with his people after Adam. And we'll look at each of those three. All right, so let's look at the, the covenant of works. Um, the, the covenant of works, and we're using that terminology, and I'll expand on that a little bit later, was between God and Adam, right early on in the garden. And we know the terms, right? What were the basic terms? Actually, it's, it's slightly fuller, right? You can, you can have any tree in the garden, but don't touch this particular tree. Now, there were other things that Adam had to do, all right? Go forth, multiply, take dominion over the whole earth. These are all part of that covenantal structure, and we're going to look at some of those in detail. But the, 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 the heart of the heart of the covenant is something that Adam had within his power to perform. To take or not to take. To eat or not to eat. That's why we call it the covenant of works. And we're using that terminology. There's different terminology. But for now, we're just going to stick with that. And we'll look at it in more detail. As I said, this is the introductory stuff. And then we start looking at the detail as we go on. All right? Secondly... Um, Covenant of redemption made between God and Christ. Christ is the representative of his elect. He says he will come to save a people, right? So even as I said, before time, um, God planned and agreed between the Father and the Son that the Father and the Son, that the Father would give a people to the Son. All right? Um, John speaks about this, doesn't he? He talks about, all the Father has given me shall come to me. All the Father has given me shall come to me. So God has entered into the screen, and Christ becomes the good shepherd. He becomes their, their representative. All right? Um, it's an eternal agreement before time. Um, it's a one of headship. When Christ acts, if Adam is the first great representative, and we're going to spill out what that means, well, Christ is the second man, the last Adam, and he becomes the second great representative. And frankly, when you break it all down, the only thing that matters in the whole of the Scripture is what has your representative done? I mean, it breaks down at that most fundamental level. Do you have Adam as your representative, or do you have Christ as your representative? It's not about what you've done, it's about what your representative has done. That's the most fundamental thing, all right? And Jesus comes and undertakes to be his people guarantor, all right? And he undoes what Adam did. And therefore, instead of the day you eat of it, you shall surely die, which happens to all of us, right? Um, now we have life, and we have hope because of that second great representative who's come. And thirdly, we have the covenant of grace. Oh yeah, let me, let me ask you a question quickly while I've got this last thing here. Um, are you saved by works or are you saved by faith? Be careful how you answer that question. Oh, by, by the way, let me just warn you in advance, all my questions are loaded, all right? So there, there, there's never a right or a wrong answer. There's a... Well, if you mean this, then that, but if you mean that. So, let me, th let me work you through. In terms of Christ as your representative, are you saved by his faith or by his works? By his, his works. His works. He works as the second representative to earn the salvation that you take by faith. Okay? That's what I said. It's a bit of a trick question, right? So, you know... We are saved by the works of Christ done for us as our representative, which we receive by faith. Okay? And we're going to expand about a little bit, a little bit further on that. All right. So that just gives you that breakdown. So we've done covenant of works with Adam, a little bit of the, the, the covenant of redemption, 
And thirdly, we're going to look at this idea of the covenant of grace. Now, some of these terms, like the covenant of works or the covenant of redemption, actually does apply in Scripture. But the covenant of grace, these are, these are words that don't actually come directly lifted off the page of Scripture, right? They are what we'll call theological constructs. They are constructs which describe something. Now, now the fact that we don't have an exact word for something is not necessarily a problem. Uh, what, what, how do we describe God, which we, we use a theological word rather than uh, a word that comes straight off the page of Scripture? What's a theological word that we use? God is, I mean, again, uh, huh? Yeah, I mean, any of those, and you can use those, and that's legitimate. I'm just thinking of that, the most fundamental in terms of sovereign, yeah, um, yes, but that, that word pops out, I am the sovereign, <laughs> okay. I'm just looking, and again, a lot of these questions are what am I thinking like, not what the right answer is, okay. So I'm just thinking about the word Trinity, right? We talk about God being triune, don't we, okay? Is that, does that term, is that term Trinity actually used in Scripture? No, it's not. But it accurately, when it's understood, it accurately reflects that there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one God. All right? So we can use words to accurately describe things. And, and what we're using here is this term, this covenant of grace, actually describes a whole series of covenants that run right from the very, very first promise. What's the first promise in Scripture? First promise in Scripture... Oh, no, let me rephrase that. What's the first promise in Scripture after Adam's sin? So, because that, that, that promise controls everything that's going to come out after it. No, before that. Genesis 3. What's that promise about... A serpent and the head of the serpent. Right, right. So all the way back, the very, very first promise that you get is back in Genesis 3.15. All right? There will be two seeds. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and between your seed. All right? He will bruise your heel. You will crush his head. And that's the first promise, which then... If you look at it, it's, um, I mean, the best way to illustrate this is, is like a, a mountain stream, right? It starts, I mean, a mountain stream starts really, really small. But as it goes down the mountain and it picks up more, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And so by the time you've got all the way down, it's the same stream. It's just picked up more and more and more. And that one promise continues all the way through, and that's part of the covenant of grace. So it's a series of promises or a series of covenants that run all the way from there. The substance is exactly the same. Just like the water at the beginning is the same water as in the end. But it's a lot bigger, isn't it? It's a lot fuller. You understand far more by the time you get to the end. But it's the same message. And because it's the same message, we talk about the covenant of grace. A series of covenants all working together, which expand God's promises. Um, generally in Scripture, God is revealed in his works. God is revealed in his works. So the greater the work, the more you find out about God. So when God creates the heavens and the earth, that is a great work. And we learn an awful lot. I mean, people use sovereign, people use the word omnipotent or omniscient. You know, all of those things you can sort of start teasing out from God's original work, right? But as God goes through, greater things start happening. And his greater work is salvation. And in, by the time you get to the New Testament, now you're learning an awful lot about God that you hadn't seen in the Old Testament. Or well, certainly not with the sort of clarity. So God is revealed progressively over time because his works are progressively more and more and more. And let me tell you, the next great work that God will do is when he comes again. And then you will have another huge bunch of revelation when all of your hope is turned to sight and all of our ignorance, and I, I mean all of our ignorance, will suddenly we'll be able to see very, very clearly things that we never saw before. All right? So God is revealed in his works. He's revealing progressively. So we talk about progressive revelation. The stream is the same stream. It's just getting bigger and bigger 
and bigger as it goes down, all right? So it's that series of promises or the series of covenants that run. Now, um, the last thing I want to do, and then we'll have a break, is I just want to talk about the relationship between the three covenants. And if you turn the page over, actually, there is a diagram on page 12, which I'm going to try and talk you through that diagram. That's the easiest way for me to do this. Um, the, first three, the first covenant is the covenant on the left of the diagram. So we've got God who enters into a covenant of work with Adam as the representative. That's straightforward, all right? Then we have something interesting. Then we have the second covenant that we spoke about, the covenant of redemption, that eternal covenant made between the Father and the Son before time, where the Father says, I will give you a people, and the Son says, I will obey, I will do everything, I will win that people by my actions, by my works. I will become their king and their priest and their prophet, and I will, if you like, I will do everything so that I can save that particular people. But that has to touch the ground somewhere, doesn't it? You have that promise. And it touches the ground, if you like, in the covenant of grace. So you have promises in the Old Testament. Um, you have promises uh, that run right from the book of Genesis, right towards the end. That's the covenant of grace. All of those represent various parts of the covenant. But those covenants in the covenant of grace only occur because the Father promised the Son, and the Son said, I will go. So the foundation, if you like, if that's making sense, the foundation of all of those covenants that we are going to read about, running up to the new covenant, behind that is operating the covenant of redemption. Does that make sense? Right? So it's a foundation. So I've got that there on the diagram. So that's number two. You've got the promise between the Father and the Son. How does that manifest itself? Well, in a series of covenants culminating in Jesus saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. All right? Does that make sense for everybody or not? Is that clear? Okay, great. And, and some theologians, and you'll, you'll see this if you read the books, and my, my job tonight is to lecture, to open up the topic to you, but as you go through the topic and maybe you, you get captivated and you want to find out more, you'll see some theologians will just talk about two covenants. They'll just talk about the covenant of works and the covenant of grace because they're including that eternal part under the heading of the covenant of works. Other theologians will talk about three covenants. The covenant of works, which remains constant, right? And then they'll talk about the eternal covenant, and then they'll talk about that eternal promise to save a people, and then how it's actually applied in the covenant of grace. But really, those two are really intimately related. God's promise to the Son that he will have a people, how does it work its way out? It works its way out for our benefit, if you like, in the new covenant, doesn't it? Where he gives himself. All right? And so there are two aspects of one thing. That's probably the best way to think about it. There's not, you, know, you can either say you've got three covenants, or you can say, I've got two covenants. I've got the covenant of works, and then I've got the covenant of grace, which is this eternal promise, which lands on, in history as that series of covenants called the covenant of grace. Okay? Any questions? All right, um, let's just talk about the importance of all of this just for a second. Um, why is it important? Um, why do we live in a world which is like it is? You know, I was reading some of the plaques up here. Um, uh, how old was the gentleman up there when he died? Does it say? Or do you have to work? Pardon? 45, yeah. This is 22 years here. All right? And he died. And he died. What explains the world we live in? Covenant theology explains the world we live in. That original promise to Adam is why sin entered, as he says in Romans, and sin entered and death reigns. It goes back to that original event in the garden, all the way back there. Sin and death began to flow, rule, and reign. So without understanding that, you, you, you know, the most fundamental thing in your whole life, one day that you will die, <laughs> is wrapped up 
in a basic understanding of what we've been talking about tonight. Had Adam obeyed, there'd be no sin. There'd be no death. The wages of sin is death. What an amazing place it would be. All right. No sin, no death, no consequence, no death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain. But it all flows out of that. Why do men do the things they do? Because they've been brought under the power and rule and reign of sin. It all flows under that. Secondly, um, we've talked about this. The father looks down. He sees Adam. He knows that Adam has ruined the race. Adam is the beginning of the race. He's the fountainhead of the race. He knows that sin is in the world. He knows that everything is now controlled and under the dominion. What do we do? Well, he doesn't leave things there. He sends the second man, the last Adam. He enters into that second great covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the son says, I will go. I have a people. I will go. I will give my life for my people. All right? And the spirit then is poured out and applies the things of Christ to us. All right? So our salvation rests, if our damnation rests on Adam, and the certainty of our damnation rests on Adam, well, the certainty of our salvation rests on Christ. Absolutely. The certainty of our salvation is fixed on Him, His works, the things that we've done. All right? And uh, that, that's why this is absolutely foundational. Absolutely foundational. And also, I hope as we go through, you're going to see that, um, that it'll help you read the Scriptures better. When you're reading the Scriptures, you'll go, which covenant am I under? <laughs> what's controlling what's going on here? Because there are distinct steps. As the waterfall sort of steps down, and there's distinct steps as the river moves, moves towards the ocean, well, there are distinct breakpoints and steps as we go through the Scriptures. And you'll begin to say, well, oh, okay, I'm at this point of Scripture. This is what's really important. This is how things are working. All right? Now, one last thing, and I am going to close it down, but I have a little thing here about called advanced excursus. Um, and this is really, uh, I'm not going to lecture on it. Uh, there are a few advanced excursus on it, but if you really want to start digging deeper into certain of the issues or certain of the, 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 the issues that arise with covenant theology, uh, it's history, because this is now being discussed. Um, the first covenant theologians uh, were in the first century. So covenant theology as a body of knowledge where people have studied the covenants runs all the way back to uh, right in the, in the early you know, hundreds. And there's a history. You, you can go back and read people who are writing about the covenants that far back because they recognized how important it was. Um, but obviously there's been a lot of complexity. God's word in some areas is extremely simple and in some areas is very complicated. And so what I've done is I've moved some of the more advanced stuff. If you want to go study it, there's trigger points there, and it, it describes some of the difficulties. And I've given you some big pictures. What's a covenant? We've given you a definition. And it's a bond in blood, sovereignly administered. It works most of the time. It doesn't work all of the time. Um, but it's a good definition, but there are some issues with it. But if you want to go and start digging a little bit further of how we define the word covenant and how should it be used. Some of, the, uh, some of those things come out of there, but we've got to start somewhere, right? So we're starting with the basics, and then you can go and read some more. Let's, uh, let's close the lecture from now. Let me just close us in prayer, and then we'll um, have a break for a little while, and then we'll start with a second lecture. And really, I wanted to go through one and two tonight, all right? And, and that's my, my big aim. Father, we do thank you for um, these things that you've given to us in your word. Many things, many things to remember. Um, but we would be made wise unto salvation. We would grow in our knowledge and faith. We would learn to see the things that you've done and from it to worship you more and love you more deeply and, and humble ourselves far more before your word. So bless us and teach us, we pray. Remember us, we ask. For we ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen.